All right. Well, good morning, and thank you so much for the invitation to speak with the group today. Um, again, my name is Melissa Whitman. I'm an assistant professor in the kinesiology and applied physiology department here at the University of Delaware. And today I'm going to be discussing some research surrounding my recently funded R01 um, that actually stemmed from a University of Delaware uh, free subproject. So the title of my project is Cardiovascular Consequences of Duchenne Becker Muscular Dystrophinopathies. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so in general, uh, muscular dystrophies are a group of genetic conditions that are characterized by progressive muscle weakness and wasting. And so Duchenne and Becker are the two most common forms of muscular dystrophy that occur in approximately one in every 5,000 boy in the United States as far as uh, Duchenne, and it occurs in approximately one in every 18,000 boy um, as far as the Becker. So both um, Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy are characterized by a mutation in the dystrophin gene. And so in DMD, the uh, mutation prevents the production of a functional uh, dystrophin protein, whereas in BMD, there's a partially functional dystrophin. Um, therefore, in the BMD, uh, symptoms are not quite as severe. Now, uh, dystrophin is a protein that anchors the muscle to the surrounding tissue, and therefore skeletal as well as cardiac muscle and smooth muscle that lack functional dystrophin are mechanically weak, and therefore uh, muscle contraction also leads to cell damage and eventual cell death. Right. Now, um, both DMD and BMD are, like I mentioned, characterized by progressive muscle weakness and degeneration. And so we often associate these diseases with skeletal muscle um, problems, such as you know, loss of muscle mass, um, inflammation, fibrosis, as well as respiratory issues, which we can all see in, in this diagram here on the right. However, um, symptom onset typically occurs in kind of early childhood. So with DMD, this is usually around the age of three to five years, whereas BMD, it's typically five to 15 years. Um, however, in the last about probably 10 years, many of the respiratory related causes of death have been resolved and therefore cardiac symptoms have been unveiled. And so in fact, it is now recognized that the leading cause of death in these children um, and, and these boys specifically are a dilated cardiomyopathy and the resulting heart failure. And we actually see an incidence of this cardiomyopathy of about 90% um, by age 18, at least in the case of the DMD. Uh, less is known about the BMD. Um, so they, overall the skeletal muscle sort of side of things is not as severe, but there is some indication that perhaps the cardiac issues are brought on even earlier because of the fact that they're able to be more physically active for longer, that actually puts more stress on the heart. So again, um, you know, an area that we're, we're trying to, to sort out. Unfortunately, life expectancy is limited in both the DMD and BMD uh, boys. So life expectancy of DMD is only about 26 years of age, whereas it's a little bit later, but still only about 40 to 50 years of age in the BMD. And unfortunately, there is no cure um, for either DMD. Okay. Now, um, when it comes to the cardiovascular involvement, so this is you know my particular interest is on the cardiovascular side. Um, cardio cardiovascular complications are progressive, uh, with patients developing sort of preclinical cardiac involvement as early as five or six years old. And then we typically see a dilated cardiomyopathy by mid-teens, um, which you can see in the diagram in the heart on the right. Now what happens is that as cardiomyocytes die, they initiate the inflammatory, fibro or inflammatory process and fibrosis or scar tissue occurs. Now the fibrotic regions eventually stretch, uh, become very thin, and then lose their contractile uh, function, resulting in enlarged heart chambers and decreased wall thickness. 
Um, we also typically will see a lot of arrhythmias uh, in these boys. And overall, all of these changes result in a decrease in their cardiac output, uh, hemodynamic decompensation, and eventual heart failure. Now, unfortunately, loss of ambulation, um, and this is particularly true with the boys with DMD, um, they usually lose ambulation by about age 10 to 12, um, so they're they then become wheelchair bound. And so largely because of that and their overall physical inactivity and some of the other respiratory complications, uh, these often obscure sort of the recognition of the cardiomyopathy and the ensuing heart failure. So typically in older individuals, you know, shortness of breath, exercise intolerance, these are the hallmark symptoms. Um, but a lot of these go unnoticed in these boys. Now, my research career has largely been focused on the vasculature, and so we all know that there's more to the cardiovascular system than just the heart. And so, like I said, a lot of my research has focused on the health of the peripheral vasculature. And so we know that a healthy vasculature is essential to maintaining homeostasis and, among other things, you know, regulating blood flow and maintaining adequate blood pressure. Uh, however, vascular dysfunction has been widely observed in animal models of DMD, and consequently, these vascular abnormalities impair blood flow and cause muscle damage in these animals. Um, therefore, vascular dysfunction may be both predictive and or associated with the onset of cardiovascular disease in both the DMD and BMD, um, as well as actually contributing to the disease progression. Um, so vascular dysfunction is something that we commonly see in the development of a lot of cardiovascular diseases, in particular heart failure in our older adults. Um, but again, much less is known and it's really not been well elucidated um, in these patients. Okay, so this actually leads me to, you know, this background kind of led me to my COBRE project um, that was funded back in 2016. And so this subproject was part of the COBRE in cardiovascular health that Dave Edwards um, was the PI on, and then there were five of us that all had subprojects on that on that grant. And so this sort of led me to this project, and essentially some of these data that I'm going to show, you know, just briefly today, have provided the necessary pilot data for my eventual R01 submission. So just in short, as I mentioned, you know, one of our questions was regarding peripheral vascular function in these patients. And so one method of assessing um, microvascular function, or essentially the health of the downstream uh, resistance arteries, is by looking at the hyperemic response to passively moving someone's leg, as you can see in the picture on the left, just through a normal um, 90 to 180 degree uh, range of motion. And so we can see on the lower right our typical hyperemic response. So this is a second by second view um, of the femoral um, blood flow going through the femoral artery um, to the lower leg. And so we can measure this in a couple of different ways. We can just look at the peak response. We can look at the overall um, change from baseline, so the delta, um, or the area under the curve are three of the typical ways that we can we can look at this. Um, but either way, um, the higher, the better, the lower, the worse off. And so here on the right, these are, you know, again, some of my preliminary data that I had pulled from my COBRE project in looking at these hyperemic responses. And so we can see that the responses, the hyperemic responses are drastically attenuated in both of our patient groups. So we can see the BMD, um, children in yellow and the DMD in gray as compared to a group of our typically developing troll children. And so again, you know, this is this is indicating that they have far worse microvascular function than they should um, at this age. Okay, um, moving on, and again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but additionally, uh, vascular dysfunction can also alter wave reflections returning to the heart from the periphery. So if you think about it, um, when the heart beats, it sends a wave out through the arterial tree. Um, when these waves hit um, a site of impedance, so this could be a bifurcation or just a 
a point of change in arterial size or wall stiffness, then we have a, a wave that gets reflected um, back to the heart. And so we can see this in looking at the um, image on the left. And so we, we have a device called the Sphygmacore um, that we can use just kind of standard brachial cuff um, to generate these central aortic waveforms. And so on the left, um, this wave, this upward motion, um, this is sort of the forward moving wave. And then this little, little blip, the second little hump that's lower down, um, that is actually when the wave is returned. So this is the reflective wave. So this typically occurs during diastole, which actually helps um, with cardiac filling. And so again, this is what our central aortic wave should look like in a healthy young individual. So here on the right, we have a wave that we may see in an unhealthy you know, disease population or even just an older individual. And so what happens is that the reflected wave comes back too soon. And so this could be because there's a lot of resistance, it could be because the arterioles are stiff, um, you know, a variety of different reasons. But what happens is that this wave comes back faster or too early, so that instead of occurring during diastole, it actually comes back and occurs during systole. And so this is added pressure that the heart has to overcome in order to pump blood out. Okay. And so there's a couple different ways of looking at this. Again, just for the sake of the next 30 seconds, focus on the augmentation pressure. So again, this is the augmented pressure necessary um, for the heart to pump the blood out. And then something else we can calculate is the augmentation index, which is just looking at um, essentially the augmentation pressure um, in, in terms of the overall pulse pressure. And, and we can get a percentage. And so again, these were data um, from my COBRE project, uh, looking at augmentation pressure on the left and then augmentation index here on the right. And so what we can see is that, again, in a, a normal healthy individual, we will actually see augmentation pressures being negative because again, you know, it, it's occurring during diastole and not during systole. Um, whereas we can see that in the BMD as well as the DMD kids, um, there is an augmented pressure. So essentially what's happening is that the heart is having to work harder to pump blood out. Um, when we look at the augmentation index, again, this is, um, in this case, it's normalized to a heart rate of 75 because we do see some heart rate differences um, in our patients. But again, this is just looking at kind of the same sort of thing, but as a percentage. And so again, we can see a, a negative value, which is good in our controls, but then we can see an elevated augmentation index in both the BMD in the yellow and the DMD in the gray. And so I will tell you, there has been very little research that's been performed in pediatric populations. Um, but just as a reference on here, I have children with CKD, so chronic kidney disease, um, are on the top dashed line. And then um, they tend to be in sort of the 13% range. And children with type 2 diabetes are on the lower dashed line, and they're in kind of the 6% the range. Whereas the values that I'm seeing in these um, children with DMD um, is hovering around like 26 to 27%. So this is honestly the highest augmentation index I've pediatric. And so this is very problematic because, you know, again, as I mentioned, this earlier and sort of greater return of that reflected wave magnitude can have many different deleterious effects that can include um, left ventricular hypertrophy, uh, concentric remodeling. It can result in myocardial fibrosis, um, which we already know there's fibrosis occurring in these hearts just because of the lack of dystrophin and, and the damage that's occurring. Um, so the fact that this is maybe contributing to even further fibrosis is, is of course, I think very problematic in these kids, um, as well as you know contractile dysfunction, and so this is a whole vicious feedback cycle that you know again leads to poor blood flow regulation, you know a worse hemodynamic profile, which favors the development of heart failure, which we know is essentially um, what's happening ultimately in these kids, and so 
I've hypothesized that, you know, the vascular dysfunction and the increased kind of pulsatile load or the extra work um, that the heart would have to do, you know, like I said, it is, is very detrimental in these kids with DMD and BMD um, and may actually be contributing to their cardiac disease progression. But these parameters really have not been studied extensively and, and have not been studied well, which is, you know, what led me to my R01. And so, um, just in, in short, I'm, I'm really just getting this project up and going, um, but the title of this project, like I said, is Cardiovascular Cons Consequences of Duchenne and Becker Muscular Dystrophinopathies. I have three aims, the first of which is determining the effects, you know, of these diseases on peripheral vascular function um, in sort of a, a much more expanded way than what I had done in my COBRI. Um, second, more closely looking at the effects on the pulsatile load on the left ventricle. So the methodology that I used in my COBRI was, was good for a, a first glance, um, but I'm actually working with a cardiologist up at UPenn that has really um, kind of revolutionized how we can look at this um, by actually looking, you know, doing a, a cardiac echo, getting real, you know, the, the data that I showed before, that software uses some assumptions, and so now we're going kind of straight to the source so we can bypass some of the assumptions being made and, and measure things directly. And then third, sort of determining if these vascular function measurements and these pulsatile load assessments can actually predict the cardiac function in patients with DMD and BMD diagnoses. Um, and we're doing this by doing a full cardiac echo so that we can then kind of match things up, which the same is a little bit more exploratory. So in short, I'm enrolling 50 children with DMD, 30 children with BMD, and 50 uh, typically developing children um, to serve as my controls. I do have a cross-sectional and longitudinal components. Um, you know, we'll look at them cross-sectionally, like I said, which will be baseline. And then for my kids with Duchenne and Becker, we'll be bringing them back in for 12 and 24 month follow-ups, again, to, to try and track disease progression in these children because we, we do know they are progressing, but we don't, we don't have a good sense of you know, how quickly and, and how fast. Um, we're recruiting kids between the ages of 7 to 21 years of age, so um, I would throw this out there. If you know of anyone um, you know, that has a diagnosis of Duchenne or Becker, um, please send them my way. I am recruiting from Nemours as well as CHOP and the Kennedy Krieger Institute um, down at Hopkins. Um, or if you know of or happen to have any typically developing children, um, or boys specifically, between the ages of 7 and 21, uh, you can also, you know, send them my way um, because we are looking for the, the healthy controls as well. So that's the phone number to my lab and my email address if you need it. Um, and so with that, um, that's all I have. I do, you know, as always, want to acknowledge both my current and former uh, members of my lab, my clinical coordinators and collaborators, as well as my funding sources. With that, I'm happy to take any questions.